1921, Kronstadt, beginning of the counter-revolution. This is from the um, the Internationalist Communist Tendency website, which is lefcom.org. Today we are the witnesses of a tragedy of a social revolution being contained within national frontiers. As a result of the passiv passivity of the peoples of Europe, faced with intelligent and well-armed reactionary forces. It is thus stifled and reduced to playing for time with the enemy within and without. We have seen many mistakes made, many errors revealed, and from the libertarian point of view, many precious truths have been confirmed. Thus wrote Victor Serge in June 1921 in the preface to his essay, The Anarchists and the Experience of the Russian Revolution. The essay was an appeal to the anarchists to recognize what was proletarian and positive about the October Revolution. Although it was written before the rising at Kronstadt in March 1921 against the Bolsheviks, Serge makes no reference to that tragedy in his introduction written a few months later. Indeed, the states that his, sorry, indeed he states that his conclusions are more true now than they were a year ago. What the quotation highlights is the fact that the isolation of the social revolution to one territory was now becoming an unbearable burden. Not only did Kronstadt throw a flash of light which illuminated reality, as Lenin said, but the events of the 10th Party Congress, adoption of the NEP and the banning of factions, the failure of the March action in Germany and the adoption of the United Front policy in all but name at the Third Congress of the Comintern, May 1921, a highly significant year in the degeneration of both the Russian and international revolution. This article is aimed at weighing up the significance of that decline 85 years ago. 135 years ago, the Paris Commune of 1871 gave a glimpse of what the working class could achieve and how it could run society for itself. But after 74 days, the commune was crushed by the bourgeois government of Thiers, backed by the international power of the capitalist class. Confined to a single city, it was isolated and defeated with 20,000 Parisian workers, massacred in cold blood in a single week in May 1871. In response, the communards shot their bourgeois hostages. The number of ruling class victims of the commune was 84. Thus, it is always the white terror of the ruling class that exceeds in numbers and horrors the red terror of the working class. As Marx noted, the problem of the commune was that it was isolated to a single city. The problem of the Russian proletariat was that the revolution was isolated to a single country. The Russian Revolution of October 1917 remains the only occasion in history when a contingent of workers actually overthrew the capitalist state power over an entire territory. For this reason, we continue to examine and try to understand it. The fundamental question is to explain how a, how a revolution, which began by offering the widest liberation to the working class and thus to humanity, could have become by 1928 one of the greatest tyrannies of the 20th century. Looking back on the events of 85 years ago with the benefit of hindsight, we can understand that 1921 was a significant turning point on the road to defeat for the revolution. At the time, it did not appear so to many of the participants. The 1921 was a year of crisis they could plainly see. Over one million dead from famine, with many more from typhus and other diseases. The outbreak of strikes against the Council of People's Commissars and the Kronstadt Revolt brought home the harshness of the situation. And to add to the woe, the international revolution not only failed to occur as the Bolshevik leaders expected, but suffered a hammer blow with the defeat of the March action in Germany. Our task here is not simply to chronicle what went on, but to explain what it means for us today. We are aware that there will be no revolution like the Russian experience again, nor are we using the condescension of the present as E.P. Thompson called it. Any revolutionaries who seek simply to slavishly replicate what happened in Russia deserve only ridicule, as do those Trotskyists who consider the question of leadership to be just a question of the right individuals in strategic positions.
We need to avoid the trap into which so many so-called Marxists and revolutionaries fall in seeing the past as a blueprint for the future. However, only by learning from what really happened can we arm ourselves for the struggles ahead. And the first step in this learning process is to debate what the significance of the past is. 1918 to 21. Already some libertarian Marxists and anarchists will be screaming that the revolution was long, long, was lost long before 1921. We don't deny that Soviet power in the territory of the Russian Socialist Federated Soviet Republic, the name USSR was not adopted until 1923, was already an empty shell by the end of 1920, although there were healthy pockets of it in 1919. Nor do we deny the excesses of the Cheka during the Civil War where it became a state within the state. But the Red Terror arose out of the Civil War. In November 1917, the Bolsheviks were letting former Tsarist generals go free if they promised not to take up arms against them. A few months later, the same Tsarist generals were not only leading invasions of Russia, armed by British and French imperialism, but were literally crucifying any workers they suspected of Bolshevik sympathies. Although both sides resorted to terror in this class war, it was hardly on the same scale. Here we can point to the evidence of the U.S. commander in Siberia, General William S. Graves, who reported that, I am well on the side of safety when I say that the anti-Bolsheviks killed 100 people in eastern Siberia to everyone killed by the Bolsheviks. Nor do we claim that the revolution had abolished capitalist relations of production, except insofar as there had been a total economic collapse as soon as the Bolsheviks came to power. Since at least 60% 60, 60 of industry was devoted to war production, achieving peace meant unemployment. As Edward Acton observed, in the aftermath of October, the country suffered an economic collapse on the scale of a modern black death. The capital lost no less than a million inhabitants in the first six months after October as workers streamed from the capital in search of bread. Even those workers who had jobs still had to spend their time looking for food and demoralization was compounded by mass abs absenteeism. Attempts by Bolsheviks on the factory committees at this time to increase labor discipline led to new delegates being elected who were more compliant with the workers' demands. Eventually, though, even these factory committees began to be more concerned with labor discipline and output. In the anarchist libertarian demonology, this was, of course, because the Bolsheviks had suppressed the workers' initiative in the factory committees. But this is too simplistic, as S. Smith showed in his Red Petrograd. One cannot see in this the triumph of the Bolshevik party over the factory committees. From the first, the committees had been committed both to maintaining production and to demonstrating factory, or sorry, and to democratizing factory life. But the condition of industry was such that these two objectives now conflicted with one another. But the civil war was taking further toll on the revolution. The Bolshevik party had been a party predominantly of workers in 1917. By 1920, these workers had become officials in the Red Army, the Cheka and the bureaucracy. By 1922, over two-thirds of the party membership were administers of one kind or another. At the same time, the fight against imperialist invasion in the whites had led to a closing of ranks. Inter-party discussions declined, and increasingly the local elected posts were filled by the local party secretary simply appointing delegates to higher bodies. The practice of democratic centralism within the party, where lower bodies elected all higher bodies, had virtually collapsed. What was left was only centralism. It needed only a Stalin to become the party secretary in charge of these local secretaries, to have in his hands the levers of power. But that was still some time in the future. When Serge arrived back in Petrograd after being deported from France in January 1919, he reported, We were entering a world frozen to death. At a reception center, we were issued with bread and dried fish. Never until now had any of us known such a horrid diet. Girls with red headbands joined with young, bespeckled agitators to give us a summary of the state of affairs. Famine, typhus, and counter-revolution everywhere. But the world revolution is bound to save us. And it was this belief in the world revolution which lay at the heart of the hopes of the Russian working class even at the beginning of 1921, when they had suffered and were suffering so much. 1921-22. 
Serge was asked, "What is the French proletariat waiting for?" by his young hosts, but it was the German proletariat that most Bolsheviks had the highest hopes in. The Third Communist International. The whole Bolshevik program cannot be understood without reference to its international character. The insistence on outright opposition to the imperialist war in 1914 distinguished the Bolshevik party as the only major European party to oppose the war with, re with revolutionary demands. It was the Bolsheviks who led the split at the Zimmerwald and Kienthal conferences with the centrist and pacifist socialist majority. And when the Bolsheviks came to power in Russia, they shared exactly the sentiment of Rosa Luxemburg that the question of socialism has been posed in Russia. It cannot be solved in Russia. At the Third Congress of Soviets in January 1918, Lenin stated, The final victory of socialism in a single country is, of course, impossible. Our contingent of workers and peasants, which is upholding Soviet power, is one of the contingents of the Great World Army. And in March, at the time of the acceptance of Brest-Litovsk, he repeated this. It is the absolute truth that without a German revolution, we are doomed. In his April theses of 1917, Lenin had posed the need for a new international to replace the second, which had gone over to imperialism in August 1914. The war itself began to provide the material basis for this international as workers and former social democrats stepped up their resistance to their own governments. The First World War's end was hastened by the strikes in Vienna, in Hamburg, and Bremen, and all across Germany. When news reached Moscow of the Vienna Rising, Radek, one of the Bolshevik leaders, recorded the spontaneous demonstration that occurred outside the Kremlin. I have never seen such a sight. Workers, both men and women, and Red Army soldiers filed past until late evening. The World Revolution had arrived. The masses of the people were listening to its iron step. Our isolation had ended. This was a bit premature, although many wor workers and ex-soldiers around Europe were increasingly supportive of the Soviet idea, this had not taken the concrete form of new communist parties in most countries. Even in, even in a place like Germany, the revolutionaries had failed to distinguish themselves clearly from the social chauvinist socialists. Although Luxembourg and Leibniz had formed the Spartacus League, they remained inside the German centrist USPD which included Kotsky and Bernstein, as they feared isolation from the mass of the class. This only confused the workers and isolated the Spartacists from the smaller but politically clearer groups, such as the Bremen Left and the International Socialist, Socialists, IKD. Given, too, that the Social Democrats did not openly oppose Soviets but worked behind the scenes to destroy them, it meant that the Spartacists were not seen as the only supporters of workers' councils, as had been the case with the Bolsheviks in Russia. If we return to the Victor Serge quote at the top of this text, the greater sophistication of the Western European bourgeoisie, which incorporated so-called socialists into their defense, was a major factor in defeating the spread of revolution in Germany and beyond. As it was, the news that the Second International was reforming in January 1919 forced the Bolsheviks to send out feelers for a new international, which they intended would, would meet in Berlin. Before it could meet, Libnicht had precipitated the Spartacist uprising, which was crushed by the Social Democrats in alliance with the proto-fascist Freikorps. In the reprisals which followed, hundreds of workers were shot in cold blood, and Libnicht and Luxembourg were brutally murdered. The planned first meeting of the new international was now moved to Moscow. The move was meant to be temporary until revolution broke out in the West. However, this was the first step in the process of inter intertwining of the fate of the Russian Revolution and the international. And because it was the Russian party which physically and ideologically dominated the international, it very quickly became an organ for defending Soviet power in Russia, whatever problems it was going through. In the event, the first Congress of the Communist International did little more than declare its existence. The 50 delegates who assembled in Moscow did not all have formal mandates, a factor which only led to further Bolshevik dominance of the new body. This wasn't quite how Lenin saw it when he announced in Communist International that the new Third International Workingmen's Association has already begun to coincide in a certain measure with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics.
By this, he meant that the process of unfolding of the world revolution would also be accompanied by the advance of socialism in Russia. Unfortunately for the proletariat, the process was to go in the opposite direction. The growing counter-revolution in the USSR would also destroy the revolutionary aim of the Third International. However, this could not be seen in 1919 when world revolution and capitalist counter-revolution were locked in deadly embrace and the existence, however feeble, of the Third International was a banner around which workers everywhere could rally. Early in the year, revolution had broken out in Bavaria and Hungary, where Soviet republics were proclaimed. The Allied powers, Britain, France, and the USA, were faced with mutinies in their own arm armies in Russia. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, announced that the British intervention was not only finished, but the revolts on the Clyde and in South Wales were alarming the British state at home. If a military enterprise were started against the Bolsheviki, that would make England Bolshevist and there would be a Soviet in London. Lenin was talking about July 1919 as our last difficult July since within a year there would be the victory of the International Soviet Republic. However, the heady atmosphere which so threatened capitalism did not last. By the end of May, the Bavarian Soviet Republic, isolated even in Germany, had collapsed. It was followed in August by the Hungarian Soviet Republic, which succumbed due to internal squabbles and in the invasion of a Romanian army supplied by the Allies. By the autumn, the Whites in Russia had reached their most threatening. Yudinich was at the gates of Petrograd, Kolchak was moving from Siberia and Denikin from the Ukraine. In October and November, the continued existence of the regime hung by a thread. To add to the misery, the young German Communist Party, which had lost its best leaders in the murders of January to March 1919, was split by Paul Levi at its Heidelberg Congress in October 1919. The party had adopted the tactics of using existing parliamentary and trades unions to mean trades union means to increase its influence, but only by the narrowest of votes. Not content with this victory, Levi, against the advice of the Bolsheviks, proposed the expulsion of all those who had voted against the majority. The left wing, which constituted half the party and controlled its North German sections, including Berlin, went away to form the German Communist Workers' Party, KAPD. Similar difficulties occurred in different forms in other countries. Lenin tried to win all those who rejected social democratic reformism to the Third International, including anarcho-syndicalists. At this time, he also told the British groups negotiating to form a party that he himself was in favor of, using trade unions and parliamentary tactics, but did not condemn those who called for different tactics. By the end of 1920, the Civil War had been won, but Russia remained isolated, and the price of victory was, as we saw at the start of this article, almost a Pyrrhic one. Industrial production was only a fifth of that of 1913, and agricultural production had declined by a half. The Bolshevik economist L. Kritzman described the situation as one of economic collapse unparalleled in the history of humanity. The policy of sending out military detachments to the countryside during the Civil War to forcibly requisition grain had led to 113 peasant revolts. 50,000 followed the ex-SR Antonov in the Tambov region alone. The Bolsheviks had succeeded in retaining state power, but as Bukharin and other leading Bolsheviks, including Lenin, later acknowledged in 1921, they had held on to state power, but had lost the proletariat in the process. For Lenin, this material fact was the single most important reason for the Kronstadt Revolt of March 1921. The Petrograd Strikes in Kronstadt There is no more emotive name in the history of the Russian Revolution than Kronstadt. It is the litmus test of everyone's understanding of the way in which the revolution slid to, def slid to defeat. For most Trotskyists and Stalinists, it was either a plot of the white reaction who took advantage of the terrible conditions at the end of the Civil War to incite a revolt against the proletariat, or it was in the Socialist Workers' Party version because the Kronstadt sailors were now all peasants and this was a revolt of the petty bourgeoisie.
For anarchists, it was the real third revolution against the Bolshevik dictatorship. And for the historians of the capitalist class, it has been a gleeful episode to demonstrate that any alternative to their system to their system ends in bloodshed. <clears throat> E.H. Carr devotes only two one-line references to the Kronstadt Revolt in his The Bolshevik Revolution, Volume 1. This only underlines that his is a history of the Soviet state and not of the revolutionary proletariat. For revolutionaries today, the issue cannot so easily be ducked since it frames how we answer the questions posed by the last revolutionary experience. By 1921, Soviet power had become an empty shell. Elections to the Soviets were under the watchful eye of the Cheka. Similarly, armed guards patrolled the factories as Taylorism and one-man management were imposed on the most revolutionary working class in history. The workers accepted this as long as the civil war against the whites created an exceptional situation. At the same time, they had also accepted the abandonment of the election of officers and the armed forces as Trotsky brought in members of the old officer class to defeat the whites. But by the time the last white general had been run out of Russia in December 1920, there were already signs that the emergency regime was to continue. Grain requisitioning carried on. Trotsky had been announced or Trotsky had even announced that his Red Army methods should be imposed on the whole workforce, the militarization of labor debate, and there were no new elections for the Soviets. Everywhere the talk was of iron discipline and more dictatorship. Little wonder that the party, now increasingly a party of functionaries rather than workers, was prey to bureau bureaucratization. This bureaucratization in turn led to the emergence of opposition from proletarian groups within the Bolshevik party. Groups like the Democratic Centralists led to Azinsky and Sapronov, the workers' opposition led by Shlyapnikov and Kolontai and Miaznikov's workers' group. These oppositions, whatever their weaknesses and errors, wanted a return to the revolutionary principles of 1917. No wonder Lenin could say in February 1921, We must have the courage to look in the face of harsh reality. The party is sick, the party is shaken by fever, and unless it succeeds in quickly and radically curing its own illness, a break will occur which will have fatal consequences for the revolution. But before the party debates could begin at the 10th Congress of the Russian Communist Party in March, the workers of Petrograd and Moscow went on strike. In Petrograd, the strikes were mass affairs demanding freedom of the press, release of political prisoners, and a return to democracy in the state. Some demanded the opening of local food markets to counter growing shortages, which would eventually become famine in 1921. Counter-revolutionaries also tried to take advantage of the situation by putting forward demands for, for a return of the const Constituent Assembly. The Bolsheviks' reaction was one of panic, Troops were sent in to break up strike meetings and the leaders arrested. The Cheka put around the lie that the movement was dominated by peasant elements, since only the hardcore proletariat was left in Pro Petrograd by this time. The clinching factor in the ending of strikes was the arrival of new bread supplies, since it was the announcement of cuts in the bread ration which had sparked the strikes in the first place. The Kronstadt revolt that broke out in the naval base was a direct response to the strikes in Petrograd and the, repressed, and the repression that followed. On February 28th, delegates from Petrograd reported on the situation and the program of the sailors of the battleship Petropavlovsk was adopted. It called for new Soviet elections and for freedom for all socialists and anarchists. It is noticeable that the program did not call for freedom for the bourgeoisie and the sailors overwhelmingly rejected a reactionary proposal to recall the Constituent Assembly. Economically, the program advocated fairer rationing, limited handicraft production, and the peasants to produce freely so long as they did not use hired labor. It was in fact far less capitalist than the new economic policy which Lenin had already begun to float before the revolt broke out. Kalinin, later Stalinist president of the USSR, was sent to Kronstadt, where he simply denounced the sailors, who were not yet in open revolt, 
The response was the production of the Kronstadt Izvestia, Kronstadt News, which declared, The Communist Party, master of the state, has detached itself from the masses. It has shown itself incapable of getting the country out of its mess. Countless incidents have recently occurred in Petrograd and Moscow, which show that the party has lost the confidence of the masses. The response of the Bolshevik government was to announce that it was a white guard plot led by an ex-Tsarist general called Kozlovsky. The fact that emigre papers in Paris had spoken of trouble at Kronstadt earlier helped furnish the proof that was needed, despite the known rejection of the counter-revolution by the Kronstadters. Fundamentally, the Bolsheviks saw counter-revolution as something which could only come from abroad, and therefore the Kronstadters must object objectively be working for that counter-revolution. There were very important strategic considerations which heightened the panic in government circles. As long as the sea around Kronstadt was frozen, it could be reached. But once the ice melted, as the spring thaw took hold, then Kronstadt would be out of reach and potentially become a base from which a foreign capitalist force could operate. This is why there was no possibility of lengthy negotiations. Trotsky sent the Kronstadters an ultimatum, which incidentally did not include the phrase that the sailors would be shot like partridges. This was in fact a leaflet sent by the Petrograd Defense Committee under Zinoviev. This was rejected on March 7, 1921, when the Kronstadt Izvestia denounced Trotsky as the dictator of Soviet Russia. The first attack took place the next day, but failed with 500 government troops killed. There now came a hiatus. There now came a hiatus as the 10th Party Congress of the Russian Communist Party, Bolshevik, began on the same day. If further evidence was needed to suggest that 1921 was a significant turning point in the fate of the Soviet Revolution, then it was duly provided by the 10th Congress. There were three big issues at this conference. The first was the role of the, of the trade unions in the Soviet system. The second, the second was the policy to be adopted towards the peasantry, given that the emergency system of the, of the Civil War period had reduced agricultural production to half that of 1913, and the third was the banning of factions in the party. The trade union issue was dominated by the debate with the workers' opposition led by Alexandra Kolonte and Alexander Shlyapnikov. The workers' opposition wanted the trade unions to take over the running of production, but as they only had the support of about 50 delegates, the final resolution on the role and tasks of trade unions rejected this. Instead, it was decided that the unions would be schools of communism. Therefore, they could not be part of the state apparatus. In this light, it was also agreed that the trade unions are the one place where the selection of leaders should be done by the organized masses themselves. This itself is evidence of the extent of the decline of Soviet power since it implies that there is to be no revival of Soviet democracy. On the 15th of March, the Congress also accepted the need for a new economic policy so that the grain requisitions would be replaced with a tax in kind. In practice, this was even more of a concession to the peasants than the Kronstadters themselves were demanding. Many Bolsheviks opposed it, including Ozinski of the Democratic Centralist Group. Ryazanov described it as the peasant breast, meaning that it was another concession to a class enemy. Lenin's reply was that only an agreement with the peasantry can save the revolution. In fact, Knapp presaged a full-scale attack on the working class, since it led to the privatization of smaller firms. Without state support, they laid off workers, and this led to a rapid rise in unemployment and a fall in wages. The Bolshevik party was now both the ruling party of a state, which was attempting to hold on until the World Revolution, and carrying out the peasant counter-revolution -revolution at the same time. Despite this, as long as the Bolshevik party remained true to its traditions of open debate, revolutionaries could still preserve some hope for the future. The final resolution of the 10th Party Congress, however, called for the banning of factions, and the workers' opposition and democratic centralists were mentioned by name in the resolution. Whilst it did not have the effect that was perhaps intended, factions continued to reappear until 1920, 
1927, it did commit Bolsheviks to defend the party more strongly than ever. Indeed, Lenin seems to have overreacted to the threat posed by the various tendencies over the trade union debate. He mistakenly thought the workers' opposition was supporting the idea of the unions against that of the party. Just how far he was mistaken was demonstrated by the fact that the that whilst the Bolsheviks in Kronstadt defended the Kronstadt naval base, the rest of the party rallied together to suppress it. This included the oppositions who compromised or who comprised part of the 300 strong contingent of party delegates, which took part in the final storming of Kronstadt and which was ultimately successful on March 18th. Ironically, the crushing of the Kronstadt Commune came exactly 50 years after the Paris Commune had been formed. Serge found the celebrations of the Paris Commune a little sickening, given that 10,000 of the attacker attackers lost their lives on the ice, whilst 1,500 defenders died and a further 2,500 were captured. Some of these were shot by the Cheka. Serge, though, supported the attack himself. His agonized appraisal of the situation was as good as any contemporary could give us. <clears throat> After many hesitations and with unutterable anguish, my communist friends and I declared ourselves on the side of the party. This is why, this is why Kronstadt had right on its side. Kronstadt was the beginning of a fresh liberating revolution for popular democracy. The third revolution, it was called by certain anarchists whose heads were stuffed with infantile illusions. However, the country was absolutely exhausted and production practically at a standstill. There were no reserves of any kind, not even reserves of stamina in the hearts of the masses. The working class elite that had been molded in the struggle against the old regime was literally decimated. The party, swollen by the influx of power seekers, inspired little confidence. Of the other parties, only minute nucle nuclei existed, whose character was highly questionable. If the Bolshevik dictatorship fell, it was only a short step to chaos, and through chaos to a peasant rising, the massacre of the communists, the return of the emigres, and in the end, through sheer force of events, another dictatorship, this time anti-proletarian. Much of the same was later said by Bolshevik leaders, even if they repeated the Cheka lie that Kronstadt was a white guard plot before it was crushed. Bukharin wrote that it was no such thing, but that, but that they had to stamp out the revolt of our erring proletarian brothers. Lenin later stated more accurately that the Kronstadters neither wanted the government of the whites nor of the Bolsheviks, but there is no other. And this was accepted internationally at the time. Even the KAPD, who was already moving into opposition to the Third International, accepted in 1921 that the suppression of Kronstadt was necessary. However, it is one thing to say that all internationalists at the time supported the crushing of Kronstadt, and another not to draw lessons from it. Whilst Trotsky could still write in his biography of Stalin in August 1940 that the suppression of Kronstadt was a tragic necessity, today we can take a rather longer look at its historical lessons. Here, we cannot look at Kronstadt in isolation. As it turned out, whichever side won was a victory for the counter-revolution. However, whilst the defeat of the Kronstadt sailors was a defeat for Soviet power inside Russia, the prospect of international revolution still lay open, and this was the critical factor in the opinions of the revolutionaries of the time. The real problem lay in the fact that the party was the state. The lesson is that the party has to be the party of the international proletariat, whatever its members do, inside the Soviets of a particular territory. It may be in the future that there will be occasions where party members clash again in a revolutionary situation due to a material privation, as in 1921, but the party of the future as a body will be international. And this does not just mean in spirit, it will not be physically tied to one territorial entity. If Soviet power means what it says, then the Soviets in each territory may vote for party delegates and remove them, but the party itself stands only for the program of international proletarian revolution. It is not the state, nor does it wield state power even in the temporary worker state of the transition from capitalism to communism. For revolutionaries at the time, the young worker state had survived a critical moment.
For us, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that whatever happened at Kronstadt, the counter-revolution was on the march. We are still suffering the consequences of that today. The march, action, and the Third Congress of the Communist International. Kronstadt was not the only event in that month that indicated the ebbing of the revolutionary wave. In Germany, as we saw above, the communists had split between the KAPD and the KPD in 1919, and all attempts to reunite them fell on deaf ears on both sides. For its part, the KBD oscillated from its birth between putschism and passivity. Its participation in the so-called March Action was a disaster, which not only cost it two-thirds of its membership, falling from 450,000 to 180,000 in three months, but really sapped the morale and revolutionary will of the working class. Partly, the KPD responded to a provocation of the army, which tried to disarm workers partly to the encouragement of Radek and Bela Kuhn to help break the isolation of Soviet Russia and partly to be seen to act more decisively than it had done during the cap putsch where it had let the SPD organize the strikes which overthrew that right-wing attempt at a coup. At the end of the action, the KPD leader Eberlin tried to stimulate the workers to carry on fighting by blowing up KPD buildings a tactic which backfired when it was exposed by the ruling class. The final fiasco came when workers in Hamburg who wanted to carry on ended up fighting workers, who saw the action was over. Long before the defeat of the March action in Germany, Soviet Russia was negotiating its survival in the post-war imperialist setup. This did not mean the automatic abandonment of the world revolution, simply a recognition of the weakness of the Soviet economy and the need to re-establish foreign trade. On March 16, 1921, two days before the final suppression of Kronstadt, the British government signed the Anglo-Soviet Trade Agreement, which involved de facto recognition of the Bolshevik government in return for the suspension of all propaganda against the British in Afghanistan and India. However, secret, negoti secret negotiations had been, had been going on longer with the German army and government so that even though the March action was taking place, a German trade mission under Rathenau came to Moscow. Krasin, the Soviet Commissar for Foreign Trade, even warned German workers at this critical point that striking would impede deliveries to the Soviet Union. Further evidence that the revolutionary wave was dying out came at the Third Congress of the Third Communist International in June to July of 1921. Here, Trotsky told the delegates that in 1919, they had expected world revolution in a matter of month, months. Now they were talking about a question of years. The debacle of the March action and the Kronstadt revolt lay heavy on the minds of the Bolshevik leaders who organized the main debates. No longer was the framework one of intransigent defense of revolutionary positions in the 21 conditions adopted by the Second Congress. At this point, the main concern was how to achieve a mass basis for communist parties. Given that the revolutionary wave was ebbing, this meant seeking alliance with the very social democrats who had joined the imperialist camp in 1914 and had connived at the murder of hundreds of communists by the crypto-fascists. The Third Congress of the International was thus another watershed in the counter-revolution turn of 1921. It also indicated how the fate of the international would remain bound up with the course of the counter-revolution in Russia. This first became clear in the debate on what had previously been called the national and colonial question. Previously, the international had had an exaggerated policy of seeing national struggles against imperialism as linked to the struggle for communism. Now, only nine months after the Baku Congress, It did not even refer to national and colonial struggles, but to the Eastern question. A Russian trade treaty with the British Empire plus treaties with Persian, Iran, and Turkey meant that these governments were not to be offended. Small wonder that the Indian communist M.N. Roy delivered the only really heavyweight verdict on the debate by denouncing Comintern policy as pure opportunism, more suitable for a Congress of the Second International.
The same thing was also true of the shift in policy towards social democracy in general. The United Front with the butchers of the working class would have been proclaimed at the Third Congress if it had not already been associated with a disgraced German KPD leader, Paul Levi, who had, been, who had been expelled at the beginning of the year. Instead, the exhortation of the Bolshevik leaders in the Third Congress was to the masses. But the communists had already been using this idea, even when trying to split the social democratic parties. So what could the new slogan mean? Nothing other than a reproachment with social democracy at all levels. Whilst our political ancestors who then led the, the Italian Communist Party had no trouble with the slogan, they did choose to apply it differently. To them, going to the masses meant joining in strikes and other actions with workers in the social democratic parties, but continuing to oppose the class collaborationism of their leaders. By December, when the Russian party adopted the slogan of the United Front for the first time, it was clear that the idea was not about working with the rank and file, but with the leaders. This was the first step in abandoning the revolutionary path on an international scale. It was not announced as such, but de facto it was already that. If 1921 showed that the revolution inside Russia had now swung against the working class, it was also the beginning of the process that led to abandoning the proletarian principles of internationalism. In the verdict of our comrades in the, in the Internationalist Communist Party, the Third Congress was the turning point in the history of the Communist International. The contradictions which loomed on a global scale continued to grip the first revolutionary experience. To have made the revolution in any country, to have momentarily defeated an armed conflict, its own bourgeoisie, did not mean socialism was being built, but only the establishment of the necessary political conditions for it. It is absolutely essential to destroy the political instrument through which the bourgeoisie exercises its class domination, and to replace it with another, proletarian one, organized on the basis of an iron class dictatorship, but this in itself is not enough. In order to have gone on effectively towards socialism, the revolution needed a sufficiently developed political structure and an economy which was totally autonomous from the world market, conditions which Russia in those years lacked. Which is why the only salvation from Russia's backwardness lay in revolutionary victory in some Western or better still, some industrially advanced country. It followed from this that the Communist International and the Bolshevik Party, which, like it or not, was the backbone of the common turn, had to make every effort to accelerate or at least promote uncompromising revolutionary solutions on the basis of the first two Congresses. However, it was dressed up, abandoning the political autonomy of the class party and the dictatorship of the proletariat, served neither to convince the leaders of social democracy nor to reunite the masses around a program of revolutionary compromise, but only to confuse the international proletariat, blunt its political weapon of struggle and obscure its goals. The legitimate doubt arises that behind the official analysis of the Bolshevik leaders and the Comintern itself, there was the idea that the situation was less favorable than previously foreseen. It was thus deemed worthwhile assisting the still precarious Russian situation by an international alliance with social democracy to give it a firmer guarantee of safety than extend the revolution. Only in this way can we understand how the tactical adjustments to the United Front and the workers' government emerged from ambiguity to assume the real shape. On May Day 1922, the slogan of world revolution was missed out for the first time from the slogans issued by the Russian Communist Party. To the revolutionaries of the time, however, the significance of this was not so obvious. Setbacks will always occur in any process and revolutionaries have to maintain a rational optimism that such setbacks can be reversed. Trotsky defended the adoption of to the masses as the strategy of temporary retreat, but how long is temporary? By 1922, Bordiga was openly criticizing the danger of seeing the United Front degenerate into a communist revisionism. By 1924, he was demanding the abandonment of the United Front and the workers' government slogans as total confusions. By this time, however, further degeneration has set in with all the communist parties affiliated to the international subject to Bolshevization, i.e. their leaders were chosen for their compliance to Moscow and to the interests of the Soviet state's foreign policy. Gramsci replaced Bordiga on Moscow's insistence 
and he used various organizational means to destroy the hold that the Italian communist left held over the Communist Party of Italy, even if it did take until the Lyons Congress of 1926. By this time, our political ancestors in the communist left had formed the Committee of Intesa Alliance, whose platform summed up their verdict on the whole fiasco of the common turns policy. It is mistaken to think that in every situation, expedience and tactical maneuvers can widen the party base, since relations between the party and the masses depend in large part on the objective situation. Revolution is an affair of the masses. To conclude that 1921 was not just a chain of disconnected setbacks, but represented the real end of the revolutionary wave and the definitive beginning of the reversal of the process, which had put world proletarian revolution on the historical agenda. To the revolutionaries of the time, it was obvious that a massive retreat on the international scale was taking place. The Bolsheviks took the view that they had to hold the original proletarian bastion together until the world revolution arrived. But the weakness of the Russian proletariat meant that increasingly the Bolshevik party transformed itself not simply into the director of the state, but into the state itself. And this state was increasingly one of nascent Soviet capitalism against the working class. Thus, we have one of the most confusing counter-revolutions in history, where the party that had been the highest expression of working class consciousness in 1917 was transformed by the historical circumstance of the Russian proletariat's isolated war against imperialism into the agent of proletarian defeat. None of this went, went unremarked by the oppositions inside the Bolshevik party, and even by Lenin himself. At the 11th Congress of the Russian Communist Party in March 1922, he told delegates, and if we take that huge bureaucratic machine, that gigantic heap, we must ask, who is directing whom? I doubt very much whether it can be truthfully said that the communists are directing that heap. To tell the truth, they are not directing, they are being directed. However, only with the enormous benefit of hindsight can we see that 1921 was the year in which the revolution was lost, and this has to be part of our balance sheet of the Russian experience. What we draw from that experience is not the councilist one that all parties are bourgeois, as auto rule concluded before running off to work for the Mexican government of the party of the institutionalized revolution. Because the working class has no party or has no property to defend, its consciousness encapsulated in its program can only take form as a collective body, and because some workers, by virtue of their experience, will come to revolutionary ideas before others, they have to take the lead in organizing themselves. This means a political body which is not based on compromise with the capitalist class, but is its constant adversary. This to us can only imply a revolutionary party. What 1921 and the decline of the revolution demonstrate, however, is the need for that party to be international and centralized, prior to the revolutionary outbreak. That same party remains outside all governmental or statist functions as a body, whatever its local membership have to do. At a local level, power is wielded by the armed workers' councils. They are the only, they are the only state bodies until the bourgeoisie is suppressed worldwide. The party is a political vanguard which defends the program of communism rather than any territory claiming to be en route to communism. There may be those who would argue that this is as utopian as it is idealist, but we have to remember that in 1921 itself, at the 10th Party Congress, for a brief moment, Lenin flirted with the idea of effecting a separation between party and state. He briefly urged a clear specification and demarcation of the, of the respective spheres of each, and proposed that the organs of the state be given much greater autonomy and freedom from the party interference or and freedom from party interference. Harding later, Harding later tells us that Lenin recognized almost instantly that his proposal would not work, but this was because the situation in 1921 made it impossible to rewrite the past. The Bolsheviks could not abandon state power because the Soviets were already empty shells. Had this proposal been made in November 1917 and had the Soviets retained political life, then it would have been then it would have been possible. In 1921, the Bolsheviks were reduced to the Mykobr position of holding on to state power in the hope that something would turn up in the shape of world revolution.
All this is simply utopian if the working class is not moving en masse and breathing life into the International Party and the workers' councils. Ultimately, the only guarantee of victory is the relatively rapid extension of the revolution to at least the major imperialist countries. For until they are paralyzed, they have the capacity to destroy any revolutionary initiative. By imposing an, in an international civil war on an already exhausted Soviet Republic, they were able to destroy it materially. Whilst the Bolsheviks won militarily on Russian territory, the failure of the world revolution elsewhere meant that the class struggle was lost politically. The adoption of NEP and the United Front in 1921 were the epitaphs of that political defeat. The working class is still living with the consequences.